Hey, my friends, uh, this is a conversation that I wanted to have with a constitutional attorney in the wake of recent events. This is a thick little conversation. People are like, well, why are you talking politics? And I'm like, tell me how we can extract Christianity from American politics and we'll stop talking politics. <laughs> I've got Andrew Seidel from the Freedom From Religion Foundation joining me here. Hey, brother, how you doing, man? I am well, Seth. How are you? You are watching the headlines, and you are probably face-palming yourself through the walls of the FFRF. <laughs> I don't even know where to start, but you've been tweeting a lot and writing a lot about Christian nationalism. I guess we start with the definition. How would you define it for the audience? So Christian nationalism is a political theology in identity. It is the idea that the United States was founded as a Christian nation, that we were based on Judeo-Christian principles, and most importantly, that we've strayed from that foundation, that we've gotten away from our godly roots. And Christian nationalism is an effort to return us to this non-existent mythological past. And essentially, they want to redefine the American identity and then rewrite our law accordingly with the end goal being that Christians, and that's not quite right, really the right kind of Christian are a special favored class and everybody else second class citizens. We are in a desperate fight for our values and on Christian nationalism is on the wrong side of that. Patriotism has no religion. You know, we the people, is the word, those are the words that begin our Constitution, and they're, they're poetic, but they're also so much more. Those, those words were revolutionary. Our Constitution was the first not to mention a God, not to invoke Jesus or a deity, the first to ban religious tests for public office. America invented the separation of state and church. It's an American original. The idea was born in the Enlightenment, but it was first implemented in the American experiment. And I, for one, am proud of that fact. And I wish every citizen were proud of this American invention. And I certainly wish there were far fewer trying to undermine it with myths about a Christian founding. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, um, I, I have been saying now for almost two years uh, that it is, it is an existential threat to the republic. Which uh, sounds the, the like sub hyperbole. I mean, you say <laughs> that. Uh, no, I get I mean, you say that and yeah. they're like, oh, come on. Yeah, I mean, we've been talking about, you know, in God we trust and God bless America, God bless our troops. You know, we've been invoking God forever, I mean, supposedly, and mm -hmm. we haven't seen anything like you're talking about, except we now kind of are, right? You want to speak to that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the subtitle of my book is Why Christian Nationalism is Un-American. And my, <laughs> actually, my mom texted me this. She said, so let me get this straight. The subtitle of book is Why Christian Nationalism is Un-American. And then Christian Nationalists Attacked the U.S. Capitol on January 6th and Proved You Correct. Like, yeah, basically, mom. Thanks. Thanks for the support. Moms are great. Uh, I mean, and, and that's, it is fundamentally un-American and it is a fundamental threat to our republic. And we're seeing it now, but to me, this was so predictable because we've seen it before. In the book, in The Founding Myth, I talk about how there are, have been waves of Christian nationalism throughout American history, including preceding the worst violence internally that this country has seen, the Civil War. Um, I, I have a chapter where I talk about how to a larger extent than we've ever been willing to discuss, the Civil War was a religious war. And it was partly because religion injected itself so much into our politics that it made a peaceable democratic solution impossible. And it, it, it actually helped foster violence because you have two people on or two groups on either side of the same issue saying, no, no, God tells me I can do this. No, no, God tells me I can do this. And it makes any type of negotiation or compromise or anything impossible. And we've seen waves of Christian nationalism throughout American history. They don't often crest into violence, but it's happened in the past. And this was completely predictable. Some recent statistics and studies. Now, we have to be careful because, you know, statistics 
are bandied about left and right, but uh, <laughs> some alarming data coming in. Yeah. That's... I mean, 98% of mis- statistics are made up on the spot too. Is I don't know it? if you're aware what, of that. Yeah. What is that? Yeah. What, inspirational quote here. <laughs> and then you just put Abraham Lincoln's name under it. And, yeah. you know, he automatically <laughs> said it. But I mean, statistically, according to some recent surveys, one in four evangelical American Protestants yeah. believe some flavor of QAnon. Some mm-hmm. sort of, you know, these are the end times and Satan's trying to infect us. And maybe the Democrats really are part of a cabal of pedophiles wanting to overthrow the government and the election's not legitimate and I don't know, whatever. And then roughly 20, I think it was 25 to 30 percent say that they can envision an instance where violence might be necessary to protect the United States against this sort of perceived coup. Have you seen any of these sort of surveys, statistics, this, yeah. these trends, and can you speak to them, Andrew Seidel? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're certainly coming out. Uh, and, and to me, again, this is another very predictable aspect of Christian nationalism. The, the Christian nationalist's entire identity is based on disinformation about the American founding, that we were founded as a Christian nation, that we were based on Judeo-Christian principles, that our laws are based on the Ten Commandments, that the founding fathers were all evangelical Christians who prayed at the Constitutional Convention, that the Declaration of Independence, it was based on the Bible, right? Like, that is their identity, that we are one nation under God, and in God we trust. And so, I, I mean, I wrote the founding myth not just to debunk those lies and that disinformation. But I I actually said this in the introduction of the book, that this book is an assault on the Christian nationalist identity. Not only are they wrong, their beliefs and identity run counter to the ideals on which this nation was founded. And and the point that I'm trying to get to is that an identity based on disinformation is susceptible to other strains of disinformation. You know, so I wrote in the book uh, something along the lines of I wrote that the religious mind is primed to accept lies when presented with an extraordinary claim. It doesn't demand extraordinary evidence, but instead engages its faith to overcome skepticism. So this religion has taught evangelicals to accept rather than to question and especially accept from authority and authoritarian figures. So Trump's constant waterfall of outright lies landed on these just pliable, amenable minds. Uh, I mean, you know, and there's a lot of data to back this up, too. His support was much greater among regular churchgoers than it was among, for instance, lukewarm believers. I mean, and we, we know from the work that we do, right, that the greater the faith, the more subordinate healthy skepticism becomes. So I I wrote in the book that the biblical fetish for totalitarians may have helped America elect its first. And again, you know, I mean, that's two years before January 6th. So, I mean, this is, this to me was, was all sadly predictable. And I feel like, you know, the the lone, to borrow from that book, the the voice crying uh, alone in the wilderness for a long time. And now finally, it seems like the country is waking up to the threat this poses. And I'm thrilled that that's happening. Uh, But the question is not, what is Christian nationalism? And how do we study it? And, and, um, you know, what, what do these people believe? It's how do we fight it and push it back to the fringe whence it came? There's so much to unpack here. We speak to the fact that fundamentalists are primed for authoritarians, right? Yahweh, the ultimate authoritarian. So they believe that a prophet has been put into place or some supremely appointed leader. They just follow in lockstep because that's sort of what religions, fundamentalist religions often prime you to do. I'm also struck by sort of the militarized language of fundamental Christianity. When I was growing up, they used to teach us, you know, songs like Onward Christian Soldiers Marching yeah. On to War. So I'm a kid in private school, but we're not just singing the song. We're standing, we're doing motions, right? We're marching, we're waving flags. Uh, we see references to going to battle. We are uh, warriors or crusaders in God's army. We talk about the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So now we're crashing down strongholds. We look at a sort of a a predisposition to 
jihad, if not it's sort of a Christian jihad. You would agree? I would. I, and I, let, let's let's also state that it's better to be a warrior for good than it is to be a warrior for God. But you know, I I remember Seth in public school. I remember this in in Maryland growing up uh, in elementary school, singing Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, yeah. and re- then reading that as an adult later on, reading <laughs> reading the Bible, and that's a genocide. I mean, that is the story of genocide, of one people exterminating another. And I was a little kid singing about that in public school, and that song is stuck in my head to this day. That's how impressionable we are back then, right? And, and again, like, the ties are clear. The, there was a group at the Capitol on January 6th of in, insurrectionists called the Jericho March. They were blowing shofars, you know, the ram's horns. They were marching around the Capitol, and they helped organize this protest that devolved and became an attack. I mean, and this is a group that has named themselves after an act of genocide. Like, how can we not expect violence? How, how could we possibly think that it wasn't going to happen? When you watch the video of the insurrection and you saw the signs, many of them invoking God, we see crosses, we see invocations of one specific faith, Christianity, Everybody thinking they're doing God's good work as they crash into our institutions of government and in danger and even uh, how many how many people died? Was it five people who lost their lives? Uh, and then it, and two others took their lives afterwards as a direct result. So, it's yeah. unbelievable. Like if I knew that things would get crazy, but I never thought we'd see this. And I've had it posed to me that what happens if you have an authoritarian who is pandering to evangelical Christianity in the way that Trump did, but Trump wasn't very competent. What happens when you get in someone who's really, really smart and knows how to game that? They know how to outsmart the system. Uh, I don't know, have you had an opinion on what happens if we see another sociopath pandering to the evangelical authoritarian right, whatever? Do Do you talk about these things? Yes, I mean, I, this is, I, I think, one of the things that, that's really remarkable about about January sixth and, and about tr- the rise of Trumpism and Christian nationalism in general. You're right; like Trump was actually very adept at taking advantage of Christian nationalism, and and you're, we saw that in the imagery from the attack. I mean, countless crosses, some of them eight, ten feet tall, the Christian flag carried onto the floor of the U.S. Senate, um, you know, the Jesus 2020 banners, the prayer on the floor of the U.S. Senate, the appeal to heaven flags, make America godly again, make America godly again, a new spin on MAGA was there. I mean, Jesus saves in God we trust. Like, I mean, it's very, very clear. So Trump was adept at tapping in to that undercurrent of Christian nationalism. But you're right, he was inept when it came to be, being an authoritarian. He didn't know how the government worked. And our I don't think that our, we like to think that our institutions saved us on January 6th, and I don't think that's quite right. Um, I think we got lucky on January 6th. Our institutions did prevent Trump from doing a lot of damage, but he also did extensive damage to our institutions. And if somebody were more adept and had a better understanding of our government and how it worked, it would be very easy uh, for them to dismantle it. That's what we have seen with Trump. And and that is, I, I think, the silver lining of the Trump era, right? He exposed many of the weaknesses in our system. And what we have to do is turn around and fix those institutions. They have to be structural fixes so that something like this can't happen again. Um, it, I mean, I am, I'm deeply concerned. And I think you're seeing... You're seeing the, I won't say the heirs apparent, um, but that's what they would like to consider themselves. I mean, Josh Hawley and Ted Cruz are are angling for this. I mean, very, very clearly, you've got Josh Hawley out in front of the Senate, you know, throwing up his fist to this crowd of attackers. Um, it, it is, I mean, and he is just a virulent Christian nationalist. I don't know if you've hashtagged it, but you keep talking about unfucking the courts. You say unfuck the courts. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have seen, though, the injection. The Supreme Court's the easy example. You know, we live in a nation where roughly a quarter of our citizens identify as non-religious, not necessarily atheists, but they're not engaged in or interested in religion. You look at the Supreme Court, it looks like Catholic mass. 
with a few people who are Jews in marginally practicing capacities. I think there may be an Episcopalian in there somewhere. <laughs> this is not a representative court. How do we unfuck the courts in your words, Andrew Seidel? <laughs> <laughs> my my tweets i mean our court our, our courts are broken right now and it's not we should be clear that it's not just the supreme court uh it's it's all the way down the, the federal judiciary is has already been packed okay uh, well so hang on all, let me jump in quickly andrew sure are you saying that over the past four years they have been strategically packed or has it been going on longer i'm saying over the over the past well really you can go back beyond four years really it's more like six years uh, because there was a deliberate attempt to slow down as much as possible the previous administration's ability to uh, place judges in the federal judiciary so that there was uh, a a vacuum i mean there there was a, a a huge deficit in the number of judges on the judiciary already when trump took office uh and then they strategically flooded the judiciary with with just i mean these extreme extreme candidates who now have lifetime appointments un unqualified in many circumstances uh christian nationalists and many others and again not just the three that trump was able to put on the supreme court but all the way down to the federal district courts and how hosed are we many of these are lifetime <laughs> appointments they're all lifetime appointments oh it's, my it, god it, it is it will be this and the Christian nationalism, which if we can if we can put it back on the fringes, we, we will be OK. But the, the judges are are going to be a problem for our generation. I well, mean, for for well, I mean, you're talking 30, 40, 50 years. Do you um, support the expansion of the Supreme Court to include oh, more seats to compensate? Absolutely. I think the I think the entire the entire federal judiciary could be doubled uh, tomorrow. Um, one, they need. I mean, they're overwhelmed and overworked, so that, that'd be a good way to do that. But it would also, uh, I, I'm I'm all for that in terms of diluting this deliberate power grab. I mean, they are working to solidify a minority rule. Not that <laughs> there's already plenty of structures in our federal government that solidify minority rule, uh, but that they try, they're doing that with the judiciary now too. Yes, it, it is deeply, deeply problematic. Do you support uh, uh, term limits for judges? I mean, in theory, yes. The, for me, the problem with, with term limits is that the Constitution guarantees judges a lifetime appointment. Uh, so I think if you spend your political capital trying to craft term limits or some creative way around uh, the lifetime appointment clause in the Constitution that, that amounts to term limits. Like they're technically still on the bench, but they rotate off for 10 years and on for 10. Like they, you, you hear these various sorts of um, policies put forward. The problem is that the people who decide whether or not that's constitutional are the judges who you're trying to take their lifetime appointments away. I think it's very unlikely that um, a term limit provision survives a challenge in the federal judiciary. So if we put our eggs in that basket, uh, we are, I think, losing. I think it's far better to take all the political capital and and the, the recognition that we're seeing grow that we need to fix the courts. Um, I think it's important to take that and use it for a, a long term lasting fix to go big or go home, not try one of these smaller fixes that especially one that might might get struck down and then we're right back where we started. You wrote the book, The Founding Myth. Let's just cover that ground real fast, because I come from a culture where where George Washington Benjamin Franklin, <laughs> Thomas Jefferson, they all went to church and loved Jesus. They they decided that you know, <clears> the <throat> best country was a country that loved Jesus. And I didn't ever do my own homework on that. I didn't look at the God on the money or the Pledge of Allegiance. I mean, just sort of give me a greatest hits of bad <laughs> arguments to promote the founding of this country as a theocracy, would you? Yeah, I mean, the, the big ones are, are ones that everybody's heard. And again, the goal, right, is to form the Christian nationalist identity into the American identity so that to be an American is to be a Christian and to be a Christian is to be an American to show that they are the true heirs of the American experiment and everyone else, your, your outsiders, your immigrants, your, you're not true Americans. You're, you're the others, you're otherized. Okay. That, 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 that's the goal. And that's the goal behind a lot of the lies and myths that make up their identity. 
Uh, and, and people have heard these, right? One nation under God. Again, we are a nation under God. Therefore, if you're not under God, you're not part of our nation. In God, we trust. If you don't trust in God, you're not part of we. Uh, the Declaration of Independence references the Christian God four different times. No, it doesn't. They're trying to claim the Declaration of Independence for their own. Um, that the founding fathers were all evangelical Christians. Uh, you know, what you grew up believing. Like, that doesn't actually matter. <laughs> like, right? It doesn't matter what religion our founding fathers were. It matters whether or not they took the principles of that religion and used them to craft a government of the people for the people and by the people. And they didn't. We, we know they didn't. We've got the records of the Constitutional Convention. They didn't talk about the Bible at all. Uh, so it be, they didn't take their personal religious principles, whatever they might have been, and inject them into the country. Um, so, you know, but again, the point is, look, we are the true heirs of the people who created this nation. If you don't believe like us, you are not. Um, and it's one of the reasons that I, I really, in the book, I try to say, like, this is a fascinating conversation about the Founding Fathers, but... By having it, you're already seeding the argument. You've already lost the argument. We shouldn't be having that argument. We should be pointing out that it doesn't matter what religion they were. Um, let's see. The, uh, they prayed at the Constitutional Convention when they were crafting our, our Constitution. They didn't. Um, they prayed at the uh, Continental Congress before before there was a First Amendment, before there was a Declaration of Independence, when they were still <laughs> you know, British colonials. Like, I mean, okay, so what? The British colonies prayed that. What does that mean? Uh, it's the, that our laws are based on the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are fundamentally un-American, right? Like it would be very difficult to write rules and laws and, and sentences even that are more in conflict with the, for instance, First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution than the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. That is I mean, fundamentally un-American. You can have as many gods as you want in this country or none at all, right? And I am the Lord your God. You should, like, the power doesn't come from gods in this country. It comes from we the people. Um, it, and all of the Ten Commandments, uh, all of them, even the ones that people might not think, well, you know, what about murder? and theft? All of them, the way they're written in the Bible, are, are fundamentally at odds with American law and justice and founding principles. Oh, I love um, getting so, together with casual Christians and they say <laughs> the Ten Commandments are absolutely the most important commandments. Uh, my favorite. And I say, okay, can you name six of them? Like they know all the words to Bohemian Rhapsody, and they should. <laughs> But they yeah. can't tell me six of the 10 of the most important rules. Uh, let me backtrack real fast, because you said Go something about the Declaration of Independence, which is something I heard from a pastor recently. We were having a discussion, and he said, well, you know, why would they include that invocation of the Creator? Our rights come from the Creator, uh, or whatever, in the Declaration of Independence, this sacred document. Why would they bother to put it in there if they didn't intend no. For us to be a Christian nation, your response to that would be what? Well, it says their creator, first of all. Uh, it, it's not the creator, um, which, which suggests not a shared view, right? Like, it, it's not our creator or the creator, but their creator. Uh, and, and there's a couple different things here. And th this is um, a place where you kind of need to do a little bit of a deep dive. And so I have two chapters in the founding myth on this because you're talking about natural law. That's what this comes down to. So the other one, another phrase in the, in the declaration that people love to quote is the laws of nature and of nature's God. And for some reason, Christians think that is an invocation of their God. I mean, like I could see if you were, you know, a tree worshiper, uh, why you would like, like nature's God is not the Christian God. And, and very clearly you, we have Jefferson's other writings. We know that he was referring to natural law there. And it, this is where you start getting deep because there's two basic threads of thought when it comes to natural law. There's supernatural natural law, God-given rights. And then there's natural natural law, which is human rights. You have rights simply because you are a human being. And we know that the founders were invoking the latter here, not the former. Um, it does take a little bit of a deeper dive. And I do that in the founding myth. I've got two different chapters on this. I actually have all the, uh, the four references that supposedly invoke the Christian God. I've got what was written in the original draft of the declaration and where they were added during the editing process. Only one of them appeared in the original draft. Um, 
And it's, I mean, it's a really, really fascinating conversation. But the other thing that I love about the declaration that gets lost in this conversation is that it is not about the divine. It is not about the supernatural. It is not about the hereafter. It begins when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth like it is about the here and the powers of the earth, one people, human events. And when we focus on the one or two errant mentions that could possibly be bent into a Christian God, we're losing <laughs> sight of what they are telling this is uh, this telling us this document is about. And it is about the here and now. It's got nothing to do with God or the supernatural. I like getting back to the sources of some of this stuff. Do you know um, who wrote the Pledge of Allegiance? And they'll be like, uh, I, I, you know, tilt, <laughs> tilt. Did you know he was a socialist? And many of these people, you know, they go off on that tangent, right? Satan is a socialist. God, Jesus is a capitalist. They sort of come from that point of view. Yeah. They're like, did you realize the pledge was written by a socialist? Uh, he thought Jesus would abolish all class systems and blah, blah, blah. And they just vapor lock. And in God, we trust on the money. And you get into us versus, you know, communism around the world and sort of this national posturing. You've written about that as well. It's been your experience when you get into, do you know where this actually come from? We are a culture of celebrated ignorance on that score, right? Indeed, indeed. And, and I have a chapter on each of those in the founding myth. But the, the, And the thing that I try to point out is not only are none of those from the founding era, and yes, Francis Bellamy was a socialist <laughs> preacher who later went to work on Madison Avenue as an advertising executive, like wrote a textbook on advertising. Oh, like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, I'm sorry, he was, a, he was a socialist who then went into the free market? Yeah, he became a <laughs> madman. Yeah. Uh, uh, so he's a really interesting guy. Um, I, so I have, I have a chapter on each of those. And, and it's, it's worth pointing out that they don't come from the founding era. But I, I try to take the next step, too. Because if you look at how they were added to our um, government, to our American vernacular, it was during times of national fear and crisis when Christian nationalists were deliberately taking advantage of the country that was under duress to impose their religion on all of us. So the first time In God We Tr Trust shows up is during is 1863, uh, when you have this preacher. This is when it really is decided that we're going to put it on our coins. Uh, a preacher wrote a letter to the director of the Mint, who was a guy who wanted to get Jesus Christ added to the preamble of the U.S. Constitution. The preacher said, look, we have this... We have this heathen, the goddess of liberty on our money. We got to get the Christian God on there. I mean, this was a deliberate attempt to use the civil war when brothers are literally killing brothers to impose their religion on everybody. And you have the same thing that happens with, uh, you know, the 1950s when we see all kinds of things crop up from the national day of prayer to adding under God to the pledge to adopting in God we trust is the national motto and putting it on our paper currency to building the, the prayer room in the U S Capitol. Uh, you know, I mean, all this stuff kind of crops up then. And, and that's not only, not only not from the founding era and this push against godless communism, as you said, but it's also a deliberate attempt to sell the American public on religion in an effort to repeal all these really important New Deal reforms that empowered we the people. Uh, so, I mean, it, it, it's, again, deliberately taking advantage of times of national fear and crisis to impose Christian nationalism on the country. And that's one of the reasons that when I saw this wave coming on, of Christian nationalism with Trump, uh, that I, I, was, I was so desperate to get this book out and try to get people to wake up and give them the tools to fight back against this disinformation to, to destroy this identity. I'll uh, put the link to the founding myth in the description box. So um, I appreciate Biden in the fact that he, even though he's a devout Catholic and I, he's always talking about God and I'm like, just stop, right? The government yeah. is not a church. I, I have this conversation all the time. But at least he's acting in many ways in a humanistic way, even though he has all the freaking religious window dressing, which maddens me just a little bit. But we've got the National Day of Prayer, the, the <laughs> National Prayer Breakfast, you know, and I'm just, you know, and if you want to see an example of how this is not about the freedom of religion, 
or religions, plural, then put an imam up there instead of, of a Christian preacher and have them wave the Quran or you know any other holy book. Did you see the, the uh, Jeep commercial with Bruce Springsteen during the Super Bowl? I did. Okay. Uh, I, I just went on a rant about that on FFRF's Ask an Atheist show yesterday. Okay, well, <laughs> for those who hadn't seen it, it's I, I get it. It's another call to unity and healing. There's emotive music, and it's very beautifully shot. And you know, he's speaking in these sort of somber, thoughtful tones. And on its surface, it's hard to take issue with it after all the tumult that we've been through. The problem is, is if you stop for a second and actually think about the commercial, it revolves around a little chapel in the middle of the country. You walk in the chapel, which he does, and there's a map of the United States. And in the middle, there is a cross on the map. The message could not be clearer, in my opinion, that in order for us to have goodness and unity and peace and all these other things, we need to respond to the Christian God. And our future is uh, a nation of Christianity. I mean, the message is Christian nationalism. This was your yeah. take, yeah? Absolutely. I mean, and, and, you know, I think drawing Biden into this is is correct, uh, not because he had part of the commercial. I mean, I, let, let me put it this way. There were two things that really bothered me about the commercial. Your, your, the image was overtly Christian and more importantly, overtly Christian nationalist. And so first issue I had is that religion will literally never unify us. <laughs> it is <laughs> the most divisive force in human history. And when you turn to religion to unify a nation, you are automatically excluding everybody who is not part of that religion. I mean, it, that's just, you're talking about a huge percentage of the country. I mean, we already, we already talked about the numbers earlier. I think you could say easily say you're talking 80 million Americans who are not religious. Plus the cross is Christian. So you're alienating every non-Christian. Okay. So congratulations. Your message about unity has been fully undermined. You have defeated yourself. Well done, G. I mean, so, so that to me is kind of one problem. And this is the same problem I had with the Biden inauguration, right? Like you're talking about unity, but also preaching at the same time. Those two things are fundamentally at odds. Oh, with the inauguration other. was like Catholic mass, right? Yeah. How many yeah. priests, an Episcopalian priest, how many prayers, the Bible. And I mean, fine. You want to own a five inch Bible that's been in your family for 130 years or whatever. But he should have taken the oath on a more unifying document like the Constitution, right? That, that would absolutely be my preference. I mean, that, that really would. And, but, you know, it's... So, I mean, there's, but there's two things that we're talking about, right? There's the, when you're striving for unity, religion, turning to religion is a mistake, right? Religion only unites those who believe it. And, but the second thing, and this is where I think the Biden inauguration stopped short, but the Jeep commercial forged ahead is the Jeep commercial went into Christian nationalism, not just kind of Christianity. Uh, and that's not counterproductive. That's not just counterproductive, right? It, it's dangerous too. I mean, this is what we've been talking about. I, I was blown away. I mean, this aired like a month after the insurrection at the Capitol. I don't know who thought that was a good idea, but you can see what what is Christian nationalism is right there in that video, the flag and the cross, right? And the 48 states, they happen to leave out like Hawaii and Puerto Rico and, you know, all of the... Uh, uh, other uh, <laughs> um, places where there's, you know, maybe not as many white people. Um, it was it was just really interesting to me because the the commercial again. Supposedly we're gonna we're gonna do unity. Supposedly we're gonna uh, bring the country together at this arbitrary center spot, but it promoted the lies and the myths of the most divisive political theology this country has ever known. It reinforced Christian nationalism to the ninety. 6.4 people, 4 million people who watched that. And again, we've seen those waves of Christian nationalism throughout American history. Um, it, I've never seen it adopted to sell cars, though, again, it was deliberately sold to the American people in the 1950s. So, I, I mean, to me, this ad wasn't just shameful and, and defeated the unifying message. I also think it was dangerous. Um, and, you know, if, like, if people don't believe me, just flip the channel, go watch the impeachment that's happening right now as we're talking about this. So let's get into unity. It's another bumper sticker. It sounds good. Like, wouldn't it be nice to unify? We all come together. I'd like to buy the world a Coke, kumbaya. We all join hands in hands, hands across America. It's one of those things where if you don't stop to think about it, it really does sound good. 
But unity is so often a call to let people escape accountability. Like, I don't want unity with the people who smashed into our halls of government and betrayed the Constitution and harmed and killed people. I don't want unity with bigots and and people who are doing real-time damage. Can you speak to unity from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, unity doesn't come without accountability. I mean, trying to have the one without the other is impossible. Uh, We will... We'll never really have unity until there is some level of accountability, both for that attack and for the damage that's been done to the country outside that attack. So, I mean, to, I mean, to me, if if you care about unity uh, and if you want your party to get involved in that, you, you have to, first of all, get on the train of we are going to hold people who attacked our government, who tried to stop the the free and fair election in the United States from happening, we've got to hold them accountable. You have well, to be on that If I train. can interject too, we're also yeah. seeing the same people who were like, fuck your feelings for yeah. half a decade, right? Yeah. Now they're the ones who are calling for unity. It's a suspicious reversal now that they're having to sort of uh, look at situations from the minority position, at least in terms of the presidency, right? In terms of power, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, and, and that's the second thing, too. I, I think that there's a lot of confusion happening right now in the conversation. Uh, and I think the media is doing a fairly bad job on this this point. People are confusing bipartisan with with unity. And, and those are not the same thing, right? Like, depending on which poll you're looking at, like 70 to 80 percent of the country supports of the Biden administration's recovery act, uh, the the COVID recovery act. And that is a unifying (laughs) measure by any stretch. If 80 percent of the people support it, that's unifying. The fact that the people who are elected on the other side don't doesn't mean that it's not unifying. So so we got to stop thinking about bipartisan and unity as the same thing. They're they're not. They're they're two very different things. And I think uh, the, the media could do a little bit better job of that. Because you and I don't have enough hate mail. Let me toss this one out. We're talking about Christian nationalism. White Christian nationalism. Oh, absolutely. Is what you're seeing right now just inherently white supremacy? Yes. Um, and so I have a, I started up a little YouTube channel to talk more about some of this stuff. So I, the first video I did is what is Christian nationalism? And the second one is white supremacy and Christian nationalism. You know, what, what's the overlap between those two? And I, I joke about it in the video. And I, I mean, I, I was asked this question every, pretty much every book talk I gave in the before times. Um, you know, if you look at the Venn diagram, it's a circle. And I, it is... White Christian nationalism is what we are talking about when we say Christian nationalism. Um, And there's data to back this up, too. So, for instance, I mean, the the defining belief of a Christian nationalist is that they think the United States was founded as a Christian nation. But that means something very different to a white American and to a black American. And if you uh, check out Andrew Whitehead and Sam Perry's research, they make a very convincing argument based on data on that point. So that's just not, that's not just me spouting off that that's backed up by data. And the, I think the, the larger point can be seen. Like if you go back and watch those videos that Jamie Raskin, representative Jamie Raskin is showing right now in the impeachment and you, and you look at these insurrectionists at the Capitol, to me, the, the thing that is always so striking is the sense of entitlement that they have. Like they are, they are assaulting this, the very beating heart of our government. And, and they are doing it with this sense of entitlement. This is our house. We belong here. We're doing it at the president's direction. And, and that comes, I think, from race and religion. They believe they were acting on Trump's orders. They believe they were acting on God's orders. Every interaction they've had with the police in their life has probably been pretty positive. I mean, the, the entitlement comes from their race and from their religion. Uh, and I, I, if you watch the videos and think about that, it really, it really came home to me. And uh, yeah, if you're, if people are more interested in that, I do a little bit fuller of an explanation uh, in that, that video. Over now, what is that? Is it like a podcast? Is it video audio? What is it? Uh, it it's, it's just, it's a little video channel that I made up. So that's like original content. And then I, I have a playlist of like all my, 
not all my appearance of many of my appearances, a playlist of some of my more fun appearances where I go on right wing radio or Bill (laughs) O'Reilly's show and stuff like that. Uh, So it's just, I'm doing, I do like, I do a few like live Q and A's over there. I just, I got to go find you on O'Reilly. That guy was just so cocky. (laughs) Just so <laughs> smug and and I used to be an O'Reilly fan. I mean, I was a Fox News guy. <laughs> yeah, I right? know. I read your book. Yeah, and I uh, used to be like, "Wow, he's really smart and he's tough," you know. And and um, now I look at uh, Bill O'Reilly and I just shake my head and I think, "Wow, you know." I, I uh, what, that was my first uh, live TV interview. It was my first TV interview. It was Bill O'Reilly's show. So, talk, I mean, talk about a baptism by fire. That was like the, my first time out. Unresolved problem segment tonight, another controversy over spirituality. Ever since George Washington, presidents have sworn on the Bible that they will protect the country during their inaugurations. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you, God. So help me, God. Now, the only exceptions to using the Bible were John Quincy Adams in 1825 and Teddy Roosevelt in 1901 after the assassination of President McKinley. T.R. used the Bible in his second inauguration. But now there's a move to remove the Bible from the inauguration ceremony permanently. On Monday, President Obama will place his hand on two Bibles, one from Abraham Lincoln, the other from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Joining us now from Madison, Wisconsin, Andrew Seidel, who is with the Freedom From Religion Foundation. So, Mr. Seidel, Abraham Lincoln, and Dr. King, two amazing American icons. You just want to take their Bibles and remove them from the ceremony? Well, I much prefer Dr. King's writing on the letter from the Birmingham jail where he actually talks about the white church standing on the sideline mouthing trivialities and pious uh, irrelevancies while he does the actual work of fighting for the civil rights movement. But the okay, Bible but you itself, must know that uh, you must know that Dr. King invoked God in almost every speech he ever made. And uh, yes, but the Article his, Two, Section One of the Constitution, his, which lays out the oath, does not say anything about the word "so help me God." It says, "I will preserve to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States." Period. And it's okay. Kind but do of you know why George the Washington is going to amend that in the middle of it? Do you know why George Washington wanted the uh, words uh, God, um, so help me God, in? Do you know why? George Washington did not say, so help me God. Uh, the first recorded instance was 1881. Oh, if you look at his actually. inaugural address, Washington, it's, it's peppered Washington it's Irving. peppered with references to God. George Washington has Washington his inaugural Irving. address peppered. Go ahead. Washington Irving was the person who started the myth that George Washington said, so help me God, at the end of his oath. And actually, the French no, no, foreign no, minister he was standing right next to so Washington. It wasn't so help me God. And it wasn't said. You know, he didn't say so okay. help me God. That's correct. Do you, know and, why, do you know why Washington peppered his inaugural address with the word God? It's all over the place. Do you know why he did it? I don't know that that's Mr. actually Seidel. true. I haven't read his inaugural address lately. Ah, but well, I, you should. I would have to. And the reason he did, well, let me, let me tell you why, and then you can respond, all right? He did it because the founding fathers, all right, in the Declaration of Independence, all right, based the Which Constitution is not our founding on document, inherent rights from God. All right. That's why he did it. You the can Constitution argue with, is entirely uh, When you get to heaven, you can argue with George Washington. Dog. All right, so you the want is against an entirely the, secular document. It doesn't mention God. It doesn't mention okay. Jesus. It's it based on the Declaration of Independence. So God. It's most Constitution, not. as you probably in, in know, fact, is it's even in what pretty striking that it okay. doesn't mention. It isn't striking, Mr. Seidel. Like you don't know your history. You just don't know your history, oh, and I do. The dec- I know you would, but you're wrong. The Declaration of Independence set up the Constitution. Okay, inalienable rights given to us by God. The Declaration of Independence severed our political connection with Great Britain. It the set Constitution up of the, the United Constitution. States created our nation. You know, it was so bizarre, Seth, because you know this, but I, people probably watching don't know this. Like, you go. I, I went into a, a studio, and all. I had a Bill O'Reilly in an in-ear earpiece just directly into my brain, just like talking into my brain. And you're, I'm just looking at a camera and that's all it is. I don't, there's, there's a monitor off on like the side over here, but if you look at the monitor yeah, and not, not the, the camera, you look shady and you look like you're not being, so you have to stare into the monitor as Bill O'Reilly like yells directly into your brain and try to get a word in edgewise I mean, his whole shtick is 
as soon as you start to make a point, he's going to interrupt you and throw you off your game. Like that, that's their, their entire tactic. So you have to try to keep talking. And then there was like a, a weird delay with satellites or whatever. Um, so it was, it was a really interesting and awful experience, but I'd like to think I hold my own. It's um, the same thing with Sean Hannity and Tucker Carlson, right? The guest is there to give them an opportunity to just tell you what they're thinking. Like it's not at all about what the guest has to bring. They just need a yeah. villain or you know someone that they can stand on the soapbox. Well, I, I like to think I've been on Fox a few times now. Um, the most recent times I was on was to talk about the White House Bible study. Um, I was on Fox and Friends weekend uh, with Pete Haig, Seth, and then some preacher guy. That's that's up somewhere too. Oh, oh. Um, but the they also they talked about they talked about my book. They talked about the founding myth why Christian nationalism is un-American without having me on. So it was Pete Hegseck, and then they had a panel of three uh, religious leaders on to talk about it, including like <laughs> Rab- Rabbi Zacharias and Robert Jeffress. Oh. And they, yeah, and they put, and they, they didn't mention it by name, but they put up um, the title of an interview that I did with Salon.com um, f- about the book. And it was just, a, it was an author interview. So there's no way you can like read the story and think, oh, this is actually like a news story. It was an interview with me about the book. They put that up as though it were a news headline and then proceeded to dismantle the arg- try to dismantle the arguments that I make in the book in order, but never mentioning the book. It was the weirdest experience. And it was um, one of my coworkers sent me a link and they're like, hey, Andrew, I'm like pretty sure that they're talking about you and your book, but they never <laughs> say it. Like, and I was watching, and I watched the like, oh my God, this is the weirdest thing. It was so bizarre. So I like to think that that they're scared of having me on now. That's uh, that's how I'm going to read that situation. Uh, that's how I would read it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're, you're, don't mess with Seidel. I mean, he, if he's going to unfuck the courts, he'll definitely mess you up at Fox News. So, all right, my friend, what do we do now? I mean, how can you and I engage in a meaningful way to. You know, to help fix it. Uh, I, I, a lot of people, back when I first became an activist, they would talk about having like an atheist political party, which I think is just insane because atheism is just the lack of a belief in God. It doesn't necessarily mean anything else. I also think it's a top-down approach, right? I think the culture mm-hmm. underneath, right? Doesn't the foundation of the country have to change before the government and the courts better reflect it? Am I right? Am I wrong? Is there another angle? I mean, uh, uh, how do we fix the country? Is is what I'm saying. Come on. <laughs> well, uh, not to uh, put uh, all uh, that on I your shoulders. You that Ten seconds, what? I can tell you the answer for that. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, to me, I, I do think, as I've been saying for almost two years, that Christian nationalism is is the biggest threat that we're facing. I, I think a lot of the the ills in the country can be traced back to that. Uh, the The problem is that because this is a, a an identity that is based on disinformation, it's, that's going to be notoriously hard to unwind. Uh, but that, I mean, that is, that's literally exactly why I wrote the founding myth. The fa- I mean, it's a different book because there have been previous books that have corrected the record, right? They, this is what history tells us. And this is what the founding fathers meant, but they left it at that, but right. Correction and facts are not enough. And it's, it's mind blowing that we have to say that, um, but right, like Donald Trump wouldn't have been president if facts and were enough, if pointing out errors was sufficient. So we have to do this, that, but then we have to take the next step. Uh, we, and, and that's what I really try to do in the founding myth. It is an assault on the Christian nationalist identity. Not only are they wrong, their beliefs and identity run counter to the ideals on which this nation was founded. They, they are fundamentally un-American. And, and we have to continue to point that out. And, and there's, I think there's a lot of hope here. Uh, if you if you look at some of the research that Whitehead and Perry, who I mentioned earlier, have done, they think that about 20% of the country are like, like diehard Christian nationalists. But 32% are what they call accommodators. So that they're not maybe uh, fervent Christian nationalists, but they accommodate that belief and and help it grow and fester and even seize power. And and those people can be convinced and shown the error of their ways and that it's wrong. And I think it's it's really up to us to be out there um, having these conversations and pointing it out. And, and so much of it traces to all these different myths that we've been talking about, one nation under God and God we trust, all that. So, I mean, I mean that's why I wrote the founding myth. Yeah, uh, but that, that's, mean, how much of what we do now is just a sort of a political version of counter-apologetics? I mean, this is the OAN culture, right? This is the Newsmax <laughs> culture. We've got platforms. We, you know, the Republican Party defined by the My Pillow guy, 
right? That's where we are. So it's it's a resisting of this weird floodgate or series of floodgates of Christian nationalist propaganda, right? Yeah, no, I mean, it, it, it is... And the I mean, the propaganda is all over the place on that side, too. But it, it, the narrative, it's also the narrative, Christian national, white Christian nationalism is the narrative by which the shrinking conservative white Christian minority is seeking to maintain power and political ascendancy over the majority that is interested in equality and racial justice and reproductive justice and environmental justice and economic justice. And as we near the tipping point in which that power and privilege are reduced to equality, they're going harder and harder and harder after those myths, right? So it, it's up to us to kind of kind of push back more. And I, it, it, I know it's hard. I know, I know it's really hard to fight disinformation. Um, and it's kind of a central question that people are having. Uh, you know, I, I've been talking with friends who have family members who've been sucked into this Q, QAnon nonsense. And some of them are starting to wake up now realizing that, oh, none of this stuff's actually happening. I mean, that does uh, bring it, the it, question, like, do they get so radical that even the radicals say, this is crazy. I mean, do they, because they're kind of like a, a cornered animal. Right? They're looking mm -hmm. at the, the demographic shift and yeah. they're looking at their own obsolescence. So they wig out and everything's, you know, the Democrat pedophiles who are funded by George Soros are drinking the blood of babies with Hillary Clinton and the basement of the pizza parlor before communism. I mean, you know what I'm saying? It, I, absolutely. I mean, they're not going to go gently into the obsolescence for which they are bound. They're going to rage against the dying of their privilege, right? And and that's what we are seeing happening. Um, it, it's up to us to, to force them into that, that obsolescence. Um, you know, obviously I'm talking about with, with argument uh, and, and dialogue. I mean, so, so it's, I know it's hard, uh, but that's what we have to do. And I think too, um, to, to back up a little bit, you know, doing state church separation and, you know, professional atheism or whatever you would call it, um, trying to build a secular community and a secular political power base. I've always thought doing this for a living, I've always thought that we were not going to win this fight in the courts we are going to win it in the court of public opinion and with demographics. And then by eventually, yes, gaining some political power, not by having a national atheist party, that's not going to work, but by bringing our goals into the mainstream. And one of the, I mean, one of the things that I lo love to point out and that I wish more of us would do a better job talking about is that state church separation is, is almost a silver bullet. And I get like, like for a lot of people, the idea of fighting for state church separation is that like, this is kind of like a privileged fight. Like, what does it matter if the government has an official religion or if there's a national day of prayer when people are sick and dying and impoverished and homeless and out of work? Like, what, is, what does it matter if the courts are on the brink of repealing reproductive rights or our, our schools are failing and our healthcare is being ripped away? Like, what does it matter if, if the government wants to pray when our brothers and sisters are being killed in the streets and people are being thrown, children are being thrown in cages. And, and to me, I understand that, but I also think that it matters more, right? Like the kids who were being thrown in cages were being thrown in cages because Jeff Sessions, the then attorney general, cited Romans 13, which he learned to do in the White House Bible study. Like that, it, you can draw a direct line between every one of those kids sitting in cages and Christian nationalism. And whatever issues you care about, limiting power of religion in our government, ending the Christian nationalist influence is going to help. I mean, it's, it's not a panacea, but it's damn close. If you want better education, do you want full funding for public schools instead of vouchers for private religious schools? Do you want accurate science about evolution and sex taught in our classrooms? Do you want full civil and political rights for LGBTQ and women and minorities? Do you want reproductive justice and choice to be fully realized? How about a greener world and a healthier environment? Do you want us to get serious about global climate change and shun its deniers? Do you want access to better and universal health care? Do you want scientific research to be guided by scientists? Do you want to solve the problems in the Middle East? Like, do you want our response to pandemics to be guided by science and not wishful thinking? If, if you end Christian nationalism, if you end religious encroachments into our government, you will see progress on every one of those issues. So I get that secularism may seem like the fight for the few, the lucky, the privileged. I, I think it's a fight for all of us. And the good news is, is that 
Your version of the fight won't feature you brandishing an AR-15 next to desaturated will, photos of your political opinion or opponents, rather, <laughs> that like Marjorie Taylor Greene. I, is it hyperbole to say that she is the face of the 21st century Republican Party? Like, I don't see her as a one-off. No, Marjorie of Taylor Greene. I, I just I, think I, this is the state of the Republican Party in the 21st century, right? The mm -hmm. Jewish space laser lady right yes I, I mean i absolutely think that's fair hillary's I mean, eating <laughs> babies lady that's the 24 i mean that's not hyperbole i don't think yeah so. and i i should make it clear i'm appearing on this show in my personal capacity not in my professional capacity as a representative of an organization but i think that's at, that is absolutely right i mean like they've they voted on it. Like, I mean, they, they voted on it, as far as I'm concerned. So, but yeah, the, the idea I, that she was selected for a committee that had any influence on education in the first place. Since, yeah, is, I mean, if you want a good example of my rant, which I apologize for, I gotta sometimes I get on the soapbox, and you know how it is. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> like, I mean, it's a perfect example. Uh, I mean, she, she again, a virulent Christian nationalist. Uh, there was actually FFRF did a report on the 147 members of Congress who voted against uh, certification of the vote and, and tried to highlight their ties to Christian nationalism and their, and their ties to their churches. And it was like 99% of them are Christians. Um, and most of them were Christian nationalists. People can go check that out on the website. Um, again, appearing in my personal capacity at this okay. point in time. All right. Well, I mean, you actually sort of capped the show in such a great way. I had, I, I probably shouldn't have digressed with the Marjorie Taylor <laughs> green reference, but you know, I just shrug and say, I mean, I, I knew people were gullible. Hell, I was gullible. But I would like to think even when I was a true believer, I would have looked at that woman and said, she has checked out of the hotel reality, right? She is long <laughs> gone. Yeah. Um, and I mean, this it goes to what you and I were talking about in, was it December or January, where we, we were asking the question with Rebecca Marker, like, do we live in a shared reality anymore? No. And that, <laughs> And, 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 but right, that's part of the problem with your earlier question of like, how do we fight this? How do we do this? It's like, what we're really at, like, how do we get people back into this shared reality with us? Um, and I, I think, I think I've been thinking about it since long before then, but also since then, I think part of it is, is working to destroy those identities. And again, I don't mean, I, I'm not suggesting violence against a person at all, but those identities are based on lies and disinformation and myths and going after those underlying lies and disinformation and myths is absolutely fair game, whether it's QAnon or Christian nationalism or religion in general. It's like my favorite uh, Ingersoll quotes, the more false we destroy, the more room there will be for the true. And I think that's God, just that a, guy was so good. That's just a great Andrew Seidel. You are <laughs> always good. You are always a great guest. And uh, I will link to your book and your, is it a YouTube page where you're posting? Your it's, videos? Yeah. My, my, my own little corner of YouTube. Okay. All that in the description box, we will continue to watch the headlines and keep doing what we can, where we can and all my best to you and your work. Okay. Thank you very much, my friend. Appreciate it.